but in terms of inherent characteristics of the world, there's a good case to be made that he's a global novelist as well. Uh, same thing, you know, Gunta Grass, we think, okay, it's a global novel, but Thomas Barnard, not so much. Uh, Lal Kandera, yes, Danny Lokesh, not so much. Uh, the judgment is not really based on the inherent characteristics of the world. I think it's based on where the reader is and, and where the work is coming from and, and how it's being presented. And I think from the publisher's point of view and the entire uh, delivery mechanism's point of view, uh, certain works get picked as somehow being more accessible to people from elsewhere and that gets popular or packaged as global. Which is not to say that works, other works from that place, if it were available in a language that the people can access, would or should not be of interest to them. So I think the more energetic readers will often use the book that has been marketed as a entry point into that new language or culture and then go on to discover other works. But many others will stay confined to what's been uh, made more easily available. Samuel, as an academic who teaches the modern novel, do you, as, as a teacher, think in terms of the global novel and do your students receive it in that way or is, 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 is are those definitions meaningless? Um, actually I just want to agree with the, 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 the two speakers that um, who, who, who is deciding on the terminology, on the framing, uh, global and it's obviously not us from the south, uh, somebody else and what are the politics behind this kind of framing, and what, who is trying to achieve what in um, speaking about the global novel, when indeed the novel has always existed, has always circulated between countries, etc. But I also want to uh, think about, you know, what would make a novel global? You know, what are the characteristics of that novel? Is it the language? Is it the content? Is it uh, I mean, what is it that would uh, render a novel global? And um, I want to speak to the moment that we are going through in Egypt, uh, for example, um, with language in particular, and how the uprising, the January uprising, has uh, uh, propelled the vernacular into the literary scene. It has spoken Arabic rather than classical Arabic. And how, over the past three years, but not just the three years, um, let's say the second half of the 20th century into the 21st, you know, writers have been carving a new language that is you know, spoken and local. And the challenges of uh, translation and translators in many ways. Uh, and, have, and because of that, many of these writers, younger writers, have indeed not been translated into English, Esperanto language, uh, have not been able to accede to this global map, literary uh, map. Um, so, you know, looking at the literary scene in Egypt today, um, one would have to say that we perhaps are not interested uh, in becoming part of that global, and it's a, a sort of imposed on, uh, by an other uh, on that. Uh, we are simply not interested uh, because um, the, the literary reality, the literary language, the literary moment and history is such that the, the writers are engaged in carving a, a local uh, moment, historical, uh, literary. So, and do they, do they get, when you talk about a, a, a local literary moment, is, is there a sense or, or even a, 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 an impetus to, to want that? I don't mean translated into English, but I mean tra translated to a wider audience, or is, is, or is it something that, that the people that you're talking about are quite happy to keep local? Of course, they, everybody wants to be translated, right? Um, but then, let me give you a, 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 um, an example politics of translation also from Lebanon, um, that you need, really need to fit into a particular framework that is acceptable to that 
global market. Uh, I am called David Leopold, a text by Hamid Sheikh, who is a Lebanese writer, um, who, when translated into English, that particular text was actually completely restructured. Um, and that was recommended by the editor uh, because it was more readable um, to a global audience once restructured. And when we come talking about a text that was really divided into four um, parts, narratives, uh, and you could, at least the editor felt, that they could fiddle around with the uh, order of these four narrative segments. But in doing so, they actually transformed the very meaning of the text and its signification, and what the readership would actually take away from it. Um, and it was only then you know, that the text could accede to that global stage and become readable right? once that is repackaged. Hugh uh, Egan, as a, as, as a critic, what, what does all of this, this debate mean, mean to you? How does it inform the choices that you make in terms of what will be given prominence in terms of reviewing or, or focus? Well, well, I want to start with the, uh, Samia's excellent point about whether or not people are, are participating in whatever this is that we're calling the global novel, because I think it's interesting to think that there's a, a, a choice on, on the part of, of a literary community not to take part. I'm, I'm thinking of, of what's imposed by the market from the other side, and uh, rather than a global novel, we might want to be thinking of an asymmetry between an English language dominant kind of literary critical culture and the actual literary world, which is in many ways not not English. And I, <coughs> I think this is more more easier easier to see when you look at European literature and smaller countries. A uh, fascinating fact that, that, that I learned recently in um, Holland, the Netherlands, uh, 50 years ago, about five percent, I think, of of, of the, the the book market was works in translation translated into Dutch. Today. It is for fiction, for literary fiction, it's nearly 70%. Which, if you think so, what is left then of the native um, Dutch writing uh, market? And, and are, are Dutch writers writing anymore for their national uh, audience? Or is it very much that you have to be now part of this international uh, uh, translatable uh, idiom that can, that can sell overseas. And, and conversely, on the US side, uh, everybody's probably aware of that, that we're still at that mark of 5% of uh, that the Dutch were 50 years ago. And I don't think it's, it's going to work. Actually, I think for works of literature and poetry, it's, it's less than 1% of the book market is works translated into English and sold in the US. So you have this kind of dominance imposed um, in part by the size of the Anglo-American market um, that I think has a, 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 a very large effect on what we're talking about. Maybe that is one something we should, should think about. Um, so I think it's difficult to, to sort of address these questions without sort of taking into consideration these forces that, that are reshaping the, the, the literary market. We can talk about it, but given that we've got writers on the panel, I, I wonder whether we can look at the impact that it makes on you as a novelist, for example, Mosin. I mean, do you, are you informed by uh, the, the sorts of forces that, that Hugh's talking about that shape the market? I mean, you know, Tim Parks wrote a, a, an article recently talking about how the, the way in which writers Many very well-known writers was a charge that he leveled at people like Kazuo Ishiguro and Umberto Eco and, and Salman Rushdie that, that somehow they write they write a kind of English that is or they'll write a kind of fiction that is easily translatable that is internationally translatable if you like um, that 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 is actually making an impact on the creative choices that a novelist makes. It might well be. I mean, as a writer, it's very hard to know. Um, 
what's going on, you know, in the black box of the creative process. Um, it might, it might, it might be the case that that um, that many writers are, you know, trying to write stuff which they think will sell. It probably has always been the case that, you know, Shakespeare, one of that, did that. Wanted to pack the hall. They would have been disappointed. You didn't have a full crowd at 10 in the morning. Um, so, so I think I think the response to a market imperative has sort of always been there. Um, it's usually not a considered response. I don't think. I mean, I'm a big fan of Ishiguro. It's hard for me to imagine Ishiguro sitting there and saying, "Okay, you know, the, the whole thing worked really well with these, you know, transplant type, you know, creatures in some sci-fi universe." And I stripped down. English parable language. I'm now going to try to make it. The next big thing is the environment. So I'm going to do some funky, you know, butler. And, uh, anyway, so he, I, I don't see writers thinking in that way that much. But in a pernicious way, of course, this stuff is going to happen. And it may be that we shouldn't even be so concerned about it happening because writers are just reflecting what's happening in society around them. In other words, you know, writers are not sitting um, hermits, you know, remotely uh, isolated from the world. Um, creating their works, the, the the changing world of publishing is such that now writers are expected to come to literary festivals, to go on Twitter, to get on Facebook, to do promotions, to do all kinds of stuff. Part of a publishing enterprise, which is becoming like this. And and personally, I you know, it, it, you know sometimes I do you know uh, people ask me, what's your job? And I said I'm kind of unemployed. Um, I sit around doing nothing, and occasionally I write. And uh, but at other times, I think you know I'm kind of the you know a multinational corporation with tiny sales in lots of different territories. But like my tentacles are everywhere. So so the Bulgarians you know buy a hundred of my books. I'm a little <laughs> Bulgarian operation. Um, and I think in some ways it is becoming a little bit like that. Uh, but what does it do? I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear you say that, that, that it's, it's true that writers might be informed by that. But what does that do to the imaginative space that we, we hold as sacred, if you like? Well, well here's the, I think that um, there are different imaginative spaces. You know, there is, for example, a, a political space, which is also an imaginative space. And living in Pakistan is something that I would certainly deal with, and I think many writers deal with. The immediate context in which you find yourself, what is sayable, what is not sayable, what narratives are people trying to say are the truth, which you, you, you can possibly rebut through fiction. It's a kind of political imagination. There's, um, there's a, you know, for want of a better word, there's a kind of um, uh, I don't know, interior imagination, you know, which is, which is part of being a writer, I think, for me is, sitting quietly by yourself doing nothing for hours. You just sit there you know, all day and you're sitting in a room by yourself looking at sort of nothing. And then stuff starts to well up. And that stuff is part of the imaginative process. It's different 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 from you know but relates to the political thing. All of these things are happening simultaneously and, and so no doubt um, um, you know, these kind of market imperatives and whatnot are, are hitting writers. Um, but I think it's very diff different, difficult to generalize about what it, that effect has, what that radiation does on writers and all. But, but one thing I would like to say is that, is that I find the term very interesting, global. You know, when you ask what's it doing to a writer. Um, presumably the global novel means the novelist is being globalized. Um, and globalization now, I think, stands for something quite bad in much of the world, even that global is not good. Um, so I think this whole conversation for me um, has within it the fear of contamination that is running rampant in our world. That we think that all of us are being contaminated by outside influences, you know, Muslims by now. Western values, Americans by Sharia, you know, Europeans by brown people, whatever it is, and and so um, uh, there's a concern that our artists are becoming contaminated. Um, I tend to think that art is born from contamination. 
that actually contamination is the reason why we have one in the first place. So I don't think that's a bad thing, the contamination. But I think the conversation that we're having, talking about global, um, it's, it's, a, it's really a conversation about miscegenation and artistic miscegenation. Anise, I, I wonder if you can reflect on, on the, the global versus the local in the context of, of publishing. I think it really comes down to uh, how much you sold in the end. <laughs> you know, as a writer, if I, uh, if a publisher and, and, and the entire critical machinery could sell a million copies of my book, I probably wouldn't mind whether they call me global or Martian. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> short of that, I mean, at the end of the day, there's a business involved here. And people are trying to sell the book, and they'll call it uh, what they need to to make that happen. But uh, to, to answer uh, what you're uh, asking, uh, I would actually like to start by pointing out some contradictions of this uh, sort of clumsy attempt at uh, categorizing the uncategorizable, which is writing. Uh, the first contradiction is, for the longest time, you know, the Americans or English or whoever was the global power, when their authors wrote, they really wrote for their audience. When, when you know, uh, somebody, uh, Paul Bowles, wrote about, you know, three unemployed, uh, uh, privileged Westerners getting lost in the Moroccan desert, uh, they didn't really think they were writing about Morocco, it was just the background. And then there's you know, countless examples uh, of that sort. And even, we, we were so grateful to be acknowledged at all in the you know, literary, uh, uh, in, in the written map of the world, that we still read it as if it were a book about uh, Morocco. You know, Paul passes through Calcutta and writes about the great Bengal Bazaar, and we're you know just so grateful that Bengal has somehow showed up somewhere. So for the longest time, that was global writing, um, and the expectation was that people from those global margins, the actual global uh, uh, you know aberrations, they should uh, when they write, uh, they should cater to the Western audience, and that meant fitting into paradigms. And that's how a lot of global journalism is done, as, as you surely know. Uh, you know, the story doesn't fit the paradigm. A lot of times they will say, eh, people are not really interested in this. So the, the same thing comes down to writing. Um, you know, and people have this notion of what will sell. And, uh, you know, publishers have that notion, agents do, and some writers are willing to cater to that. And I don't blame them for it. They stand writing has always been a commercial enterprise. You know, we don't blame any other trade for uh, trying to sell. Uh, if they're going to write something that sells in itself, then you know it's a compact between that author and his readers. That's just what it is. So, so, um, so what, what you were, what, what you were describing changed radically in the kind of 1980s when when what we onwards. describe when we what we describe as the Empire Strikes Back. You know, yeah, a whole bunch of writers from those yeah, places then started writing about the places it, that they it knew. Is doing that, and the contradiction here is you know manifold. First of all. I think Ishiguro's strongest uh, uh, novel was possibly uh, Remains of the Day, uh, uh, Rishdi's uh, Midnight's Children, which were very strongly about a place. And now they're writing these placeless novels, which actually are not that compelling. I mean, they may serve because there's such big names and so on, but uh, they're not as engaging to me. So that's one contradiction. Uh, you know, I think this so-called global writing, but whoever's writing from anywhere in the world in any language, if they want the story to be compelling, that's one of the most fundamental things about writing uh, from Greek classics to now. It has to be about specific places and peoples and issues. I don't think this uh, uh, ethereal uh, uh, place of ontology, you know, occasionally it can work with a Borges or a Kafka if the philosophy behind it is that strong, but otherwise I don't think it works. Even more funnily, like this recent debate was uh, kicked off by, I think, the M plus one article, which you know, uh, which to me was sort of a very whiny article. You know, it basically seemed to say that uh, these uh, brown and other people are just getting too much attention for being brown, but white people have gotten a lot of attention for being white. You didn't complain that. You didn't complain that. So that to me is not a good criticism of uh, the global novel. And uh, finally, uh, I, I would leave it with. Um, you know, Morrison's, it's that chain in England, Morrison, I think they, for the longest time, used to have, a, in the 80s, they used to have a food aisle called foreign food. And I think uh, we stopped thinking of global. They don't call it foreign food, they call it food of literature. You know, it's world food now. <laughs> it's world, it's world food. food now. So, so, so in a way, there's a, there's a parallel in publishing. I, I think we really have to look at what are the inherent characteristics of a work 
you know, why uh, Tolstoy or Jane Austen still appeals universally in the truest sense, and what are contemporary works that have a similar uh, ability to connect across borders or cultures, and there are works like that. I think, I think to come back to that aesthetic issue, the, the literary issue of what are the characters of this work would be the more interesting part of trying to figure out what novel is global or part of the world literature and so on. And the onus of figuring that out should be equally on all places. That's, that's my main thing. I mean, I don't think Americans should just sit around and think they're writing a novel, and we should have to sit around and think we're writing a novel. Uh, that's, that's what I would say. Hugh, I wonder, I wonder if, if what informs part of what Anise is talking about is to do with who the tastemakers are. Because in, in, in a way, it, it, what we're talking about really is where power resides and who decides a particular novel is going to be given more prominence than another. Because we know that in, for example, where, where, where I live, you know, in the United Kingdom, 100,000 books are published every year. So that, that's a tiny, tiny country, a huge amount of output. But I would say a very, very small percentage of those books are the ones that gain prominence. And all those other writers are just kind of, they carry on writing and wanting the prominence. But I'm just wondering whether this is also to do with who, who decides, who decides which novelist is going to, uh, going to get the, the, the front page of the New York Review of Books, if you like. Well, it's strange. I mean, I, I, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a marketing phenomenon that's happened over the last decades, in the last few years in particular, that, that it's, it's harder to explain, uh, but publishers will tell you this, I mean, it, it goes to the era of the huge advances to the very small, I mean, it starts before the books are written, and you have a small handful of writers now who will be simultaneously translated in many languages and released around the world, and then the sort of, well, the traditional mid-list you know, serious fiction writers who have never sold in large quantities, but there's always, you know, the serious publishing houses have always published them. Uh, though that group is getting smaller, uh, in some sense, uh, in, in representation, and it's very hard to say why this is true. I mean, as the New York Review, we're, we're trying very hard to review the, the, the most important books that we see, uh, irregardless, you know, regardless of, of um, how well they may or may not be selling. Um, but I think in general you're seeing exactly what you say, that, that uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, in the New York Times we would be the same book three different times. Uh, uh, and uh, why is this happening now? It's, it, it's, it's very hard to say. Uh, but to go back to, to uh, I, 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 this is a question for, for, for Samia, uh, I'm so interested in, the, in, in Arab literature, which is almost completely ignored in the United States, and and is is one reason that, in fact, the the the, the traditions and style, the stylistic um, uh, tendencies of, of Arab literature are so difficult to to, to translate. We, there was a beautiful novel by uh, a young Rabbi uh, Javer. Uh, yeah, only one of his books has been translated, and he has written like 15 books. Um, and I assume that the, 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 the Melly's report, uh, it's about, uh, it's very political and, and grounded in events in Lebanon in, in the 2000s. Was this why it was translated? But, uh, we, you know, we see so little, and, and that was from a very small press, and uh, I don't think it was reviewed in any of the papers. We, we, we uh, did a piece on it, but... Um, do you, do, you want, do you want to address that, that point, Samir? Sure. Uh, I think there, there, there's more than one element uh, um, that, that is responsible for the sort of absence, almost total absence, of um, Arab literary works on the global map. Uh, one, I think, is, is language. Right? You, uh, I'm assuming you put on the map and write in English, right? So it makes you immediately... And also uh, You have an edge now. Uh, you're already in the loop. Uh, whereas uh, with, with Arab writers, they have to be translated, and translation is expensive. I mean, we're, we're speaking about an expensive enterprise, and publishers need to want to invest in that to begin with, and that is very hard uh, to come by. Um, uh, the, the second uh, element, I think, has to do with the uh, 
radical change in the profile of the writers themselves. Who are these writers? Where are they coming from? Uh, and I'm arguing here that uh, writers, again, um, and I'm going to use Egypt again as the example, are increasingly coming from uh, the country's periphery and that their writings are about these peripheral areas in very peripheral language, uh, describing very peripheral and also um, Bourgeois, right? So, for bourgeois readers, they're somewhat shocking, right? Social realities. Um, and that may account also for um, the, you know, the, the, their inability or the, the, the unwillingness of the market to accept them as part of that global landscape. Right? Um, thirdly, I think, you know, when we turn it around, um, that global market has an Im imaginary already of that, what the, that other should be. Um, and therefore selectively goes through what is available uh, and chooses what is like, not what is different. So it has nothing to do with the difficulty of Arabic or the difficulty of, you know, uh, the Arabic language or the Arabic literary traditions. I think that the elements all seem to present themselves as primarily political. Well, when I, 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 I'm really interested in the, in the, in the Arabic language because uh, literary scene, because here in Pakistan we encounter the Arabic, you know, Arabic in a sense incessantly, but it usually presents itself in a kind of theological context. We talk about religion in Arabic context, and people are quoting things in Arabic, but we have basically no knowledge at all of, of contemporary like Arabic discourse. And what I've what I've wondered about is is that is part of the reason for this that um, the way in which Arabic language culture meets the world um, is like in most places is, is that intermediation happens where there's the most money. So in England, you know, in, in London for a long time and now New York in English language and, Madrid still for Spanish, even if, you know, maybe Mexico City is the rightful home or whatever it is. Um, because the intermediation of the Arabic language world with the world is taking place effectively through the Gulf, because that's where the money is. And I would imagine that Arabic language writing, like writing everywhere, must be completely subversive and destabilizing to the narrative that the Gulf is creating, that we get blocked in a way that the place where Arabic money resides um, doesn't allow Arabic culture to filter out to the world. Is that what's going on or am I completely sort of being paranoid about this? No, actually, thank you for bringing this up. No, not at all. Um, and, you know, to go to, back, back to the idea of, you know, East, East West, West, West on, on the economic ground, as you know, uh, where the money resides. Um, I think the Gulf has been uh, trying to force its way on the literary map for, uh, for the Arab region uh, through its money. Again, they've created, there are several literary awards that have been created, um, the most prominent of which has been the Arab Booker Prize. I don't know if you have heard of it, but this has allowed uh, the Arab novel to sort of be forced onto the global literary scene. So you get one sort of uh, example every year of an Arab novel that is translated into, I think, five European languages. The winner of the prize is translated. Exactly. Yeah. So you get this token. So is it always, sorry, I'm not clear about this, is it always a novel that was originally written in Arabic? Exactly. And then, right. So Absolutely. it wouldn't necessarily be, say, someone like uh, the Libyan writer Hisham Mato who writes no, in English and then translated. No. These, this is an award that is given to an Arab writer writing in Arabic. And so you get one, um, you get a short list, which is interesting because then you have titles that surface on the in, in international media. Uh, but then you also get the translation of the uh, the selection, the yearly selection. Um, but despite that effort, which I think is an interesting effort because you have a pan-Arab um, uh, uh, committee of uh, 
uh, jurists. Uh, so it's not like, um, you know, there are any strings tied to who is being selected. Um, it's quite open and the examples that have been selected are representative to a, a great extent to what is actually happening uh, on, the, on the literary scene. Um, but despite this effort, you know, none of them Well, well, we and they continue to sort of be know, I think you're right. hidden away yet again. Um, and that is the real question I think that one needs to ask. Why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why are certain literatures, even when available in English, um, um, marginalized? Unless you want to say something. Yeah, I mean, uh, going back to an earlier question from you and comments from others, uh, I can speak from the experience of Bangladesh, where Bangla has a very strong, vibrant uh, uh, tradition. And there's a lot of Bangla writers and readers who are perfectly content with what the Bangla writers are writing and what they're reading. And most of these writers have had full-fledged career without any sense of you know, deep discontentment that they've not been discovered uh, in other places and so on. So, and I, I, I imagine that, you know, even in Pakistan, I know that there's a rich tradition of Urdu writing, and I'm sure there's many Urdu writers who are, you know, really uh, popular here, uh, and, and esteemed here, and, and readers and writers who are perfectly content with the dialogue they have uh, between themselves, whether the rest of the world is, has had the privilege to eavesdrop on it or not. And I, I suspect that's the case throughout the world. So when we talk about this global novel, especially in the English context, we're talking about something very, uh, also something uh, that is on the margins of these internal discussions that are happening in, in every culture, and they have wheels within wheels as well. And, uh, and, and, in, and, and in that connection, I mean, again, coming back to contradictions, I mean, I think, in my view, to the extent there's a global novel, you know, we said that it has to fit a paradigm. The paradigm often is that, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my nice suburban Starbucks and I'm reading a book about a place that's a, uh, far worse than where I live and that makes me feel better. And uh, it's worse because usually the men and men in power are horrible. The, the women have terrible lives. Uh, and the stories about a rebel or a rebellious woman or a, somebody who's been... Always oh, not a woman. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, uh, I, I hope we don't get billed as a misogynist for saying this, but I mean, yeah, there is a, there's a, a kind of interest in the Western uh, readership. Uh, but it can be a man as well, uh, but they have to be hard done by, and they're either rescued by a Westerner, but now we've got subtle. It's, it's not usually a white man coming in to rescue, it's the values of the white man that finally comes to rescue them. And, uh, and as a result, what we, what we have is, you know, that they, they get rescued, and uh, ultimately, we have the vindication that uh, humanity survives, that these horrible places also have humanity. And, and I have connected to that, so that reaffirms my humanity. And the problem with this formula is that people can write sort of a uh, mark to this formula, but that still doesn't lead to a bestseller. You know, that Freudenberger has written a, a novel about Bangladesh, but I don't think it's done well because. The prejudice is so funny because the same prejudice that's driving to this kind of thing is now uh, also working against that kind of writing because there's those same readers sitting there and thinking, but I can read Tami Manam who's from there, so she must be authentic, which itself I think is problematic. Yeah, yeah just because someone's talking about the issue of authenticity. So it's, but before I do, Sunny, sure. you, yeah. you wanted to come in and say something that in response to Anise? Um, the, this whole idea of the global novel again, it, it makes us all, you know, from the south, you know, um, um, direct our energies towards becoming part of that. Uh, when I really think, and I was struck by, this came to me as I was browsing in the um, book exhibit here, um, that my God, you know, that it's, we're also very local as people from the South, and that we have lost the networks between us. I would have been very happy to be asked, actually, to provide a list of possible books to be dis even displayed, not sold from the Arab region, not just from Egypt. Um, just the, the, these connections to start taking place, and I think they're very interesting connections. And indeed, if we, if I would like to, to 
wanted to propose an initiative of the southern novel, that we have so much to talk about amongst ourselves, really, um, and that we're not doing that because of markets, because of um, um, uh, that we've lost these um, uh, connections. Um, and I, I would uh, fault us in the Arab region equally because we too uh, know so little about literature coming from uh, Asian subcontinent, etc. You're scribbling away, which means you've got some more things to say, but I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the time and I'm going to open the questions up to the floor. And if you're not feeling confident enough to ask any, I'll carry on asking some of my own. But I can see a hand going up in the front there. Yeah, that would help actually, because I can't, I can't actually see. Do tell us who you are if you would like to. But a question would be would be preferable to long statements, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Basim from uh, from Christiane, and my question is to the panel: In all this race for globalization or globalism, are we losing some grip on author and authorial skill? Also, if technology is helping us, like online work is coming up. How do you respond to that? Anyone? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to beat down my fellow panelists and insist that I answer this question. <laughs> they're, they're fighting for the right to answer first. Um, I think that um, I tend to think this whole question of global, global.